Paul Tower. Hello. Hello. God bless you, Dr. Wall Tower. Can you hear me? Can you hear me, Doc? Yes, sir. I can hear you fine. Hey, man. What's up? How you doing? Man, I had some challenges here on this end, but I'm grateful that I made it in on time, man. I'm going to move out of the way. I'm uh, taking care of some things here in the studio. Uh, lots of water. Uh, our roof actually caved in. Uh, so... Uh, we're taking care of some oh, things man. here. Yeah, I'm gonna let I'm gonna move over, man, and let you go ahead and do what you do on this wonderful night. God bless you. It is time now for suffering in silence with Dr. Larry T. Waltower here on the GMAP Broadcast Network, the number one faith-based motivational and inspirational broadcast network in the country. Dr. Larry T. Waltower, it's over to you. Hey, Kevin, 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 what's up, man? Thank you so much, Doc. Always a pleasure talking with you, man. Holding it down in Chi-Town, man. It's always a pleasure to hear your voice. And uh, before you leave, Doc, we just want you to know we appreciate all that you do here at the GMAP One uh, Broadcasting Network. Uh, for those who don't know, this is the number one motivational, inspirational platform on the planet. Seven days a week, 24 hours a day, 365 a year. And so, Kevin, thank you so much for all that you do, man. We appreciate you. Uh, you are a voice, you are a visionary, and you are definitely one who is victorious in Christ, and we bless God for you, man. Thank you, Doc. For those of who, who are tonight, we have with us tonight um, a young lady here from York, Pennsylvania. She is uh, uh, doing some great things here in the city. Her name is Mrs. Tanya Larry. Uh, Tanya, are you with us tonight? Yes, I am. Hey, how you doing? I'm doing pretty good tonight. Uh, wonderful, wonderful. Welcome to Suffering in Silence uh, on the GMAP One Broadcasting Network. We are so grateful to have your voice uh, here on tonight to just talk about some of the things that you're doing here in the city. Uh, for those who don't know you, uh, we want you to take a few moments and introduce yourself to our listening audience. Uh, tell us what you're doing here in York and uh, your involvement with the community. You are a community activist. Uh, uh, doing some great things here in York and across the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. So tell us a little bit about yourself and introduce yourself to the GMAP One uh, Broadcasting Network family. Good evening. My name is Tanya Larry. Um, I'm a community activist. I'm a mother of three. I had one daughter pass away. Um, I'm a grandmother of three. What I do in the community, I just try to help people um, get back on their feet, um, just lead them in the right direction as, as far as uh, what to look for, um, information that can help their families. Um, we try to get donations as far as food, furniture, clothing, um, guidance, anything that can just help a family out that's going through, um, you know, some hard times. Wow. And how long have you been here in York? Um, all my life. I'm 51 years old, and uh, I was born and raised here. Right here in York. And uh, I know you are um, uh, the sponsor of a, a, uh, a network here called The Power of a Woman. Uh, talk a little bit about that and, and what that is uh, about uh, in terms of uh, really helping uh, women have a voice here in the city. Yes, Power of a Woman, um, I uh, came up with that idea because I know a lot of women suffer from depression and silence. Mm. And mm. Um, they don't like to talk about it unless it's brought up. And um, to certain people that they trust and want to speak to, um, me, wow. um, I'm, I, I suffer from depression myself, and I'm not ashamed to talk about it because I lost my daughter in 2005. So wow. I suffered for five straight years, but I was also in therapy. And you know, a lot of people don't; their pride won't let them go to therapy to talk to someone. But um, talk, talk, my mother is. Talk, talk talk a little bit about that because I know you're a woman of faith. Um, you know our paths have crossed here in the city, particularly in, in the black church. And and my, my being a pastor, I know this sometimes is a taboo uh, discussion in 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 the house of God. T talk a little bit about uh, how you was able to reconcile yourself being a woman of faith, but yet not allowing proud pride to stop you from getting the help that you need in terms of a therapist. I, I think that's very interesting and a very uh, something that we need to give voice to. Yes. Um, for me, it was it was easy. 
Um, my family uh, guided me in the right direction after they prayed mm. for me for several years, like several days, several hours. Like my mother is um, someone that I can call and she'll be like, let's start up with a prayer first. So I felt as though um, I knew I couldn't do it by myself and I needed help. Um, a lot of people, like you said, will suffer in silence and not go seek help. Me, mm. I made the decision for me to go get help and also get put on medicine because I could not sleep, I could not eat, and I could not think right. My thinking process was not the same, and I knew that for me. Wow, wow. For those who are listening, this is Suffering in Silence. I'm your host, Dr. Larry Walthour. This is a call-in broadcast. Uh, you can call in to area code 302-202-1110. Uh, when you call in, hit the access code 538661, and you can be a part of the conversation. I do believe we have somebody who called in. Um, uh, Caller, are you there? Yes, I'm here, Pastor. Hey, how you doing? All right. Good. Thank you so much for dialing in on tonight. You're listening. Uh, well, you're on Suffering in Silence. Uh, I'm your host, Dr. Larry Walter, and our guest tonight is Mrs. Tanya Larry. Uh, would you like to have a comment, or do you have a question or something you would like to share? How you sorry, this is Shawnee. <laughs> hey, Shawnee, how, how you doing? How you doing? All right. So when did you know that you, what, what happened for you know, to know that you needed help? How did you know? Um, when I lost my daughter. Um, <clears throat> the pressure runs in my family and mental illness. So mm -hmm. I knew that when I couldn't get out of that hole I was in, I'm going to call it the black hole. That's what I call it. I was uh, in the bed, not eating, not, um, you know, feeding my children. I have two other children underneath my oldest daughter that died. So I knew wow. I was no good to them. How could I be good to myself? Right, right. So let me get this right. You, you, you have two other uh, children who are younger, and your oldest yes, daughter yes. died at age 18. And you realized yes. that you were not beneficial to your younger two children, and you realized that you needed to receive some help. Um, and, and so basically you're saying that your survival, uh, to be a mother to your, to your other two children is what prompted you to get the help that you needed? Yes. Yes. Wow. My children were in gangs. My children were out here acting out. My children were in trouble getting arrested. And one day I had a, a phone call from, uh, the principal of the school and they were like, your kids is acting out fighting and doing all types of things in the city. And my, my middle daughter got arrested. I mm. waited to go pick her up. And then when I did, I was like, I'm already going through enough. Why are you putting me through more, you know, harm? Like, you're, you're messing with my mental. And then she was like, I'm sorry, Mom. Again, she started smoking cigarettes and just, you know, my kids are just, they're, they're following other people because they're like, well, my mom's not getting out of bed, so I'm going to just go out here and do what I want to do. Wow. So I had to wake up one day and be like, no, you have to get yourself together to save your other two children. My child wasn't murdered, but, you know, she died of a massive heart attack. And I felt as though I still have to be these kids' mom. Wow. So I wanted to seek help for myself the best way I knew how. Um, Carla, are you still there? Yes, I'm still here. I mean, hi. Um, it, did, did you have something uh, you wanted to share? Or did you have another question for uh, Mrs. Larry? No, I mean, I don't have a question, but I can't be me. Um, me, myself, I, I suffer from a lot of things, but therapy and all of that stuff is not good for me. It didn't work for me, and I had spoke to Ms. Larry about it. Counseling is not for everybody. Dog so you're helping. saying that you, now, now do, you, do you feel that you went to the right therapist? I went to, to I, I went where he told me to go. I didn't like dog. I was mad at God. I went to all the therapists. I went to, I've been to plenty of them. They weren't, didn't work for me. I've never been this confident or able to do anything consistent ever in my life. I've never been able to think until I started spending time with God and coming around there and leaving my troubles on the pulpit. That worked for me. That worked and for you. That worked for me. I ain't saying don't go, that I won't go get one, but right now, God says to me, I'm what he needs because I never thought, I never needed, I never used God. I never in my life. Just when maybe like everybody else and something going wrong. Wow. But I, I, will, I, will, I, will, I wanted to be sick. I, I will say this as a pastor, uh, particularly um, in, in, in the body of Christ, 
Um, I, I definitely advocate Christian counseling um, um, as a as a means and a method to getting to a, a, a healthy place. I think one time I think one of the things that we don't do in the in the body of Christ is um, really have a very candid conversation on mental health. And a lot of times we equate and uh, being mental uh, mental health with mental illness. They're not the same. Uh, and so one of the things that I try to advocate in the body of Christ, and we have, we, we're blessed to have therapists here at Shiloh, uh, I, I strongly advocate that if you are a member of the body of Christ, that you seek a, a counselor who is rooted and grounded in the word of God that can be able to minister to you as well as give you a roadmap to a healthy place. Um, but I do applaud that, that, that you're at a point in your life where you are able to, to stand or on the word of God, I, that, that is commendable. And I, I bless God uh, for you for that. Uh, uh, Mrs. Larry, you, you, you talked about you being here from York. Uh, so you've been, you, you're here in York all your life. And I know you've seen the trends and I know you've seen a lot of things happen. How, how did the, the, the loss of your daughter change your life? I mean, um, because there are a lot of mothers here um, in this city that are like you. you know, they, they've lost their children, whether it be to natural causes. I know uh, Shanice, I know she's in that. She, that's her story as well. Um, and I know there's a lot of grieving mothers. Uh, talk, talk to those mothers that's lost their children uh, in terms of how you was able to get your life back. Um, the sad story about that is uh, most of the women in New York that lost their children to murder I'm either related to them or I grew up with these women and I know them wow. personally. Wow. So that makes it even more painful. So when you have to go to a mother that lost their child and give them comfort, you know their pain. I've been in so many groups that mothers, um, you know, come together and uh, it didn't work out because a lot of moms, like when you're first breathing, you're going back and forth in that bargaining stage where you want help, but you don't want help. You want to be around people, but you don't want to be around people because you feel as though no one understands. Me, mm -hmm. I'm just – someone listened to me when I cried and I screamed and I cussed and I, and I doubted God. Someone every, – everyone – a lot of people was there for me. So that was my blessing. Me and Shanice had a – deep conversation this morning. She was like, remember when you asked me um, why didn't I go to therapy? She said, I know why. I went to God. Do you know that, Dr. Walter, you are a very good um, person in her life? She said one day she went to go to church and she didn't know what church she was going to, so she followed the people and that led her to Shiloh Church. And everything hmm. you said that day, she said, she felt like you were talking to her directly. Because sometimes wow. when your spirit is not right, you think that someone's talking directly to you. And you're like, wait a minute, how does he know all this? So you helped her in a way that no one else could. Wow. And sometimes, like I told you, my mom prayed for me first. Then I went and got counseling. Because I, I just thought everything was against me. Why me? Why her? Amen. Wow. And a lot of mothers are going through that where they don't trust people to talk to. Wow. For those of you who are listening, this is Suffering in Silence. I'm your host, Dr. Larry Walter. I'm coming to you live from the broadcasting booth. And we have our guest on tonight, Mrs. Tanya Larry. She is uh, the sponsor of uh, a new uh, communicate a community here for, for women, giving them a voice for vision and victory and vitality called The Power of a Woman. And we're just sharing our stories on tonight. Uh, Mrs. Larry has testified, shared with us, that she lost her daughter at age 18 to a massive heart attack. Uh, we have a caller still on the line. Uh, she called in to be a part of the conversation, Mrs. Uh, Shanice uh, um, Selman, uh, who ta who's talking to us really about her story and uh, getting o over um, depression in, in the Word of God. And I will, I, I will go on record once again, for those who listen on a regular basis, you know this broadcast comes on the back end of a book that we wrote entitled Suffering in Silence. I'm a, I'm a survivor of depression, five years in pastoral ministry, pulpit depression, preaching on Sunday, praying for folk, uh, speaking the Word, preaching the Word, teaching the Word, but yet clinically depressed. And I'm, I'm a witness that God is able to meet you right where you are. So we're having a very candid conversation about therapy in the body of Christ 
and being okay with it. You can have Christ and a counselor. Uh, you can have a testimony and a therapist. And, uh, and so we're just having a great conversation. We want to thank again, uh, Mrs. Uh, Shawnice for calling in on tonight for being a part of this uh, discussion. Uh, uh, Mr. Larry, Mrs. Larry, because you are our guest on tonight, um, I want to get back to something that you said, and, 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 and Mrs. Uh, Shanice, if you're still there, you can, uh, oh. give, credence, you can, you can give credence to this uh, as well. Um, uh, Ms. Larry, you was talking about uh, when you lost your daughter and, and the symptoms of, of, of recognition, and I can relate to that, being in bed all day, not wanting to get up, not wanting to move. I mean, just uh, going into a place of isolation. And uh, really, life passing you by, and you literally just dying while living. You you, you become the the walking dead. And you talked about that. I, I would like to for you to to really uh, share more about the symptoms and some of the things that you realized that you was in a, a unhealthy place. I um I knew from the day that I lost her that I just spiraled down, like I said, in that black hole that that's mm. a place that I never want to go back to. I never mm. want to be there because I wasn't myself. I wasn't thinking well. My thoughts were sick. Um, I actually lived in my room for like about five years. I was functioning outside of my home with everybody. Hey, how you doing? Blah, blah, blah. Doing stuff with my children. And as soon as I would get home, I would cook them something to eat and then go in my room. That was my my way of just getting away from everybody. Wow. And just feeling safe. I felt wow. sick in my bedroom, and it took me five years to break that. Now, now, is, was this the five-year period of depression, or was this an additional five years? Because you mentioned that you you went through a season of depression for five years. So that time you were in the room, was that the five years of depression? Yes, it was depression. It was the feeling of hope, hopelessness. I just didn't feel like I was wanted or um, needed, but then I realized, you know, like I said, I had two daughters that I had to think about, and same with God, wow. you, like I said, I had. See, a lot of people don't have the support system. I had that, and I mm. still felt like I was, I was, I was drowning. Every day, I would get phone calls, I would get visits, I would get people just to pray for me. Like I had that support, but when you're depressed and your mind's thinking only one way, you just feel like you're lost. Like you, there's nothing that can help you. So for me right now, I've been on medicine for like 13 years to help me deal with my anxiety, my my uh depression, um not wanting to go outside, feeling like you know like my daughter's about to come home. Like these are the thoughts that we think when you lose mm -hmm. a child. Like you you still want them to be around, and we know in our heart it's not possible. Wow. So so to this day, you're still dealing with uh. Uh, dealing with uh, the medication um, to be able to help with the anxiety and the depression and the and, and the attacks. Because one thing I've and I've said this on this broadcast is that um, for me, when when I when I came out of depression, uh, there's a there's a there's a scripture in Isaiah chapter number, I think it's 61 verse three, where God says, "I'm going to give you the garments of praise for the spirit of heaviness." And one thing I've come to realize. Uh, that depression is not just a symptom. Depression is a spiritual attack. It, it, is, it is a spirit that attacks our spirit to keep us in a place of bondage. And I'm interested because a lot of times people of faith, and I, and I know you are a person who believes in God. I know uh, that you are a person of faith. Talk a little bit about how you're able to balance being a person of faith, but yet embracing the fact that I need this medication and it's okay. It don't mean that I'm, I'm not saved. It doesn't mean that I'm, I'm not walking in victory. It does not mean that I've, I've lost my testimony. Talk a little bit about that because some Christians really can't, can't, um, can't compensate. They, 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 can't, they can't reconcile. That's the word I'm looking for. They, they can't reconcile the two, the two. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of people knock medicine. They do. They just feel like, um, it's a, a a trap or, or it's something that's going to have you in that situation forever. No, like you can get off of it, but if you know in your heart that your thinking process isn't right and the way you're moving isn't right and you're not taking care of yourself and your loved ones, then you you know something's wrong. Like, like Shanice said this morning, she went to God. That's what's helping her. But now she had that wall up 
now the wall is coming down because God has given her the strength to move the way that she wants to move and to think the way she wants to think. So when I first met her, wow. she had a wall up and I could tell. I'm attracted wow. to these type of people, though. I can feel the vibe of somebody hurting, someone grieving, or someone going through something. And I'll just touch them with my hand and be like, how are you doing? Because, you know, a lot of people, um, they don't get hugged. They don't mm. need people to praise them. So it's, it's little things like that, that that can help you go go a long way. It really is. Wow. And depression is something that you don't want to just be stuck in. But you know, for me, the from danger, now on, I'm not stuck there anymore. Praise, praise, praise God. You know, the danger of depression is that if you're not careful, you'll begin to embrace it as normal to the extent that it becomes a part of who you are. Um, yeah, and, and 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 you get complacent, and, and you embrace it. Um, is 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 our caller still there, Sunny? Are you still there? Hey, um, I, I know your story. I know coming from Baltimore. I know you lost two sons, and um, and you you you've launched a a program here for um for young ladies called Fly. You talked about um you 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 had a conversation with um uh, Mrs. Larry this morning, and I know both of you um lost children. I know your story, uh, Shanice, is that you lost children to the streets, um, and 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 Sister Larry lost hers to um, to heart condition. Um, how how Shanice, how have you been able to glean from uh, from Tanya's story? Because it seems like um, you're you're at a better place now, um, where you you don't need the the therapy and things like that, and you're really coming out of the season that that Tanya is coming into. Um, but what, what have you been able to take from her story uh, to, to help you get to that place where you are, uh, Chinese? Well, I've been depressed all my life, but I didn't know I was depressed until I was 28, I believe. Um, uh, I found out that I was, uh, I used to be out and I have these moves. When like Tanya say, you get up, you want, I want to put clothes on one day. Next time I'm in the room, I live in my room. Like right now, I come home, I'm in my room. So that's the process that I want to do because I used to be out. I would be at any events. Now I just hang in my house, and I know that feeling. I hurt. Like like I told you, I know when death comes, and I just told Tony this. I know uh, November, my mom has been dead for 40-something uh, years. I noticed my body started to get the thing uh getting sad and I remember December the seventh, my son will be dead five years. So I know and then April comes, my other son been dead since April so I look forward to death more than I look forward to birthdays. And, and like I told her, I said you just be craving these feelings. You be like, oh oh Lord, I knew this day was coming because I was feeling sick just like you said, Pastor. You when you've been depressed for so long, your body, you could be happy. But your body is so used to being sad that it instantly, as soon as that death day comes, you emotional, you shut down. And um, like with my kids, I would send them places and take them out, but I always would go for a minute, but I got to run home. I, I got to be in my room. This is my safe. This is my comfort zone. I keep something, if I'm not there, something can go wrong. I got to be right here. I got to be home. So I never left the home because I left home and that's how somebody killed my child. I'm not saying that's right, but that's in my psychological mind that I need to be home because I left my child with somebody and I went away. So if I was home, it might have wouldn't have happened. No, that's not how life works. Life happens because life happens. And I had to tell myself, and then when I came in that church and you said all those things that you got to be accountable. And then, then the next time I came, you said, um, and this was a couple of months ago when I started coming back, you said something about existing and living. I say, whoa, I'm just existing because I ain't lived not dead. I've never done anything for me. So I'm just existing. I want to, I want to live. I don't want to keep mm. having these mixed emotions. I want to get out in the community. I want to be around people. But I have been shunned so much or been hurt so much and things keep happening to me that I'm afraid that something's going to happen. So I stand, a, stand still. I don't come around. I wait for someone to invite me because I've never been invited to anything in my family or 
If I did, I didn't feel welcome. So if somebody don't invite me, I won't come. And I, cause mm. I never felt welcome. Now it it seems to me you you, you talked a little bit and and Miss Larry, uh, I like for your uh, I like for you to 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 give um, some light to this as well. The guilt factor. You, you mentioned um, Shanice that you left your child with somebody and uh, they were killed in somebody else's care. And then with uh, with Tanya, with your story, with your daughter um, um, passing at age 18 and some of the health issues, talk a little bit about the guilt because a lot of people who are dealing with depression become so overwhelmed with guilt that guilt becomes a trap within the trap. Yes. <laughs> Let me tell you, um, I felt guilty for this still being alive. I wow. feel guilty for whoa, losing her whoa, whoa, at such whoa, whoa. a young age. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Time out, time out. Stop. Hold, whoa, we can't. Somebody out there may be listening to this. Let me let me get this right. Your 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 daughter passed. You had two children that were younger, and you felt guilty about being alive. Yes, I did. Yes, wow. I did. It beat me talk, up every talk day. Talk a little bit about that. That's 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 heavy. Talk, talk about that. I just felt, I'm not the only one that I think felt like this, but I just felt like it should have been me instead of her because she was young and she still had a life to live. She still mm. had a time to get healthy. She still had time to, to have babies, get married. So for her to die, and she died at home, which makes it even worse for that in the, um, the apartment that I still live in. So my your kids daughter, beat them up every day when they used to come home from school. And they used to be like, "Mom, the, where are you?" Your, your daughter passed away in the in the in the home that you're in now. Yes. Yes. Wow. And I felt and, Shanice when she was like, the the death date is always the most dreaded day because every December I fall into this darkness and this pain and this. I'm with my family members and I'm crying and I'm looking at them like they have their children. They're so happy. And yeah, yeah. I had to lift that off of me. I had to lift that off of me. December, I try to celebrate it with love, family, hugs. It, it doesn't always have to be about gifts when it's the holidays. So I volunteer and I give to others. That's my, that's what I do. Wow. Um, for those who are listening, this is Suffering in Silence. I'm your host, Dr. Larry Walter, coming to you live from the broadcast booth right here in York, Pennsylvania. And we have with us tonight our very special guest, uh, Mrs. Tanya Larry. Uh, she is the sponsor of a, a community uh, of women here in York City called the uh, Power of a Woman. Uh, it's a community uh, that's giving voice, uh, giving value, and giving vision to women uh, here in the city, those who've been suffering in silence. They have a voice. We also have a caller by the name of Mrs. Uh, Sharnice uh, Selman. Uh, she, too, is a survivor of depression. Uh, they're just sharing their story. Um, uh, Mrs. Larry lost uh, her daughter at age 18. Uh, Sharnice, she lost two sons uh, in the city of Baltimore, and they're just talking about um, the aftermath of, of depression. For those who are listening, if you want to call in and be a part of this conversation, please call 302 202 one 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 zero. That's three zero two two zero two one 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 zero. And when you call, hit the access code five three eight six six one. And we would love to hear your uh, comments, your concerns, your questions uh, to this discussion on tonight. Uh, Charlize, I think I heard you agreeing uh, in the background when when, when Tanya was talking about um, uh, being around family who got their children and their children are still alive and and the joy and i think i heard you say yep yep as if you were able to relate so you too have dealt with that guilt complex uh yeah i do it all the time and i i had to ask god to forgive me because my sister has five kids and she's never been a mother to not nail one of them i've taken care of kids why you why she was out in the street why why you i mean hey i raised mine why you why you take mine she didn't do nothing yeah i said that why you didn't take one of my take one of hers? Why you take both of mine? I raised my kids, and I thought I should have mine. Why you take mine? So you <laughs> you so even to this day, you you deal with yeah. that guilt complex. It's a struggle. 
Yeah, because I want to know why I had to lose two sons. What did I do? Why, why both of my sons? Why, why, why did I have to have two sons? I'm young. I've lost my first child at 18 years old, 19 years old. I lose my my baby boy at 44, 42 years old. So, I'm, so, so you know, so your first, my oldest son was 20, 20 years old. He was fatally abused. They burned the skin off his feet and his butt. They stuck him in some hot water. I just found this out when I came to you and shared that I finally read what happened to my son. My baby boy, they was fatally abused. They beat him and burnt the skin off his feet and his butt and let him lay there and didn't call for an ambulance. And they say he had to be so long rigor mortis has that. So my baby suffered and I should have known. I should have known. I should have been there. So you feel as if because um, you didn't know, you should have known, yeah. and and because you because you didn't know something that you feel that you should have known, yeah, I like to you carried that burden from the time that your son died until now. Yes, sir. I didn't Tanya, know uh, anything to do. What would you what would you like to say to Sharnice and maybe some other women who are dealing with that 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 guilt? It takes time. It takes a lot of time. I tell people all the time there is no time limit on grieving. Mm. People wow. people try to tell you, uh, you'll be fine, they're in a better place. That's painful because when someone is hurting, that's, those are the last things that they want to hear from someone. To me, there is no time limit on grieving. No one can tell you the time, the hour of the day that it's time up. It's time to move on to something bigger and better. It doesn't work like that. So for me, I take it one hour at a time. You know how people say take it one day at a time? I can't do that. I have to take it one hour at a time because some at one hour I might be up. The next hour I might be down. So I pray about it, and then I keep moving. I didn't want to be a grandma, but my daughter made me one, so that helped me <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Let me ask this. You know, I was still young, and I'm like, I don't want to be called grandma. And me and Bernice have that in common. A lot of us do. Like, becoming a grandparent helps us get over it because that kind of love is a love I can't describe of a grandchild. Now, mm-hmm. let me ask because I know Tanya, you're very community engaged and community involved. Is this part of what drives you to do what you do here in the community? The pain that you felt, um, and then um, what you pour into the community is that part of the therapeutic process for you personally? Yes, yes. I think that's why I go hard for other people because when people are hurting, I want them to feel a little bit of happiness going through the struggle. I want them to pray. I want them to, you know, pay it forward when when I do get them the help and the resources that they need. Believe it or not, Sharnice helped me the other day when she had her fly event at William Penn, and we sat with young girls and we sat with other women that are all going through suffering in silence. I need that book, by the way. I need to read that. I need to, I need to, like, you know, just fill that book because a lot of us suffer in silence and won't say nothing because of our pride. And pride is the worst thing you can have when you're going through something that's tearing you apart. Well, it's, 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 so interesting. it's so interesting we're having this conversation because all three of us, I mean, we're from different genders. Uh, of course, uh, I'm, I'm a male, a uh, man that, that went through depression. You and Sharnice are women uh, that went through depression. And yet we handled it differently and the impact is different, but we all suffered in silence. And and I think the danger, and you, you mentioned, um, um, Tanya, the key word, pride, because you really don't know, and, and part of it is a twofold, it's a, it's a two-edged sword. For me, I didn't know who I could trust with being vulnerable um, with, with, with facts of suicidal thoughts. You know, um, you know, being the pastor, you're preaching to people every Sunday, and people are always, you know, they they many times the congregation, and, and it's not it's not an indictment, but this is just how 
kingdom works. Many times, so many others draw from your strength, and they never think about who do you get your strength from. And so it's mm-hmm. very difficult sometimes to be vulnerable to people that's, that's depending upon you, so to speak, for their, for their victory, for their inspiration. Um, and, and I suffered for five years, likewise, um, Tanya, in silence. Uh, for those of you who are listening, this is Suffering in Silence. I'm your host, Dr. Larry Walthar. Uh, we're having a great conversation with our, ho- with our, with our guest on tonight, Mrs. Tanya Larry. Uh, she is a community activist here in York City. Uh, she is the sponsor of a powerful, powerful platform called The Power of a Woman. We also have a caller who called in, Mrs. Sharnice, uh, who's really sharing her story. Uh, and for those who might be listening in, um, who wants to be a part of this conversation, you can dial 302-202-1110. Uh, the access code is 538-661. We would love to hear from you to be a part of this conversation. Uh, you can ha- have a question, comment, concern, uh, and just let us hear your voice because we don't want you to be out there suffering in silence. I do believe we have another caller uh, that called in. Caller, are you there? Hello? Yeah, this is Fred Walker. How y'all doing? Hey, what's hey. up, man? Pretty good. How you doing, Fred? How's it going? How's it going? I just wanted to uh, join into the conversation and, um, you know, it inspired me to call in um, just with, you know, what you're saying about, um, you know, everybody handle things different. And uh, I just wanted to kind of chime in. And I'm, I think everybody, for me, I'll just say it for this listeners that's here that I lost my mom to gun violence. And, um, you know, a lot of people don't know that. But again, um, I've dealt with the, the depression differently. I suppressed it. Mm. So I didn't deal with it at all. And um, just like, um, you know, Ms. Larry said, you know, um, you know, there's no real time that you, you know, that, that, that a person can go through that grieving process. But for me to, to continue to motivate and go through life, and for me, I had to suppress the situation. And, um, wow. you know, that's how I kind of, that's how I moved about. Um, and, and, you know, hearing these powerful ladies talk about some of the things that they deal with, some of, you know, the, 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 the holidays and, you know, just dealing with, you know, blaming themselves and stuff like that. It's, it's, it's just, it's inspiring to, you know, to hear people talk about it and, 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 and see how it affects different people. Now, Fred, that's a different take on depression because I don't, I don't recall ever hearing anybody talk about the suppression aspect of it. Um, which suggests that you you kept down something that was trying to keep you down. It was a battle between you and it, and you had to do what you had to do to keep it under control. I'm interested to hear if that's something that Tanya and Sharnice, is that something that you can relate to as well, uh, having to suppress uh, that, 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 that dark place? Well, for me at times, not for my kids, uh, being, now I suppressed being shot myself. I went on a run with like Fred, I mean, I, I kept moving. I don't think I sat still since I posed and been shot, but my kids, I lost my mind. I didn't know, like Tonya, I, and I guess that's something that men will never understand because we give birth and, and. When I had my, my my both of my sons, I lost my mind. I went on a deep edge, and I didn't come back for a very long time. And um, but I when I got shot and all the other accidents, my I, I stayed on the go. I didn't let nothing hold me down because I knew I didn't have anybody. So I just forgot about everything. I just forgot about everything, and everything just came together. And I started praying, and but I I just. When it was two different times, like with my kids, I didn't know how I was going to make it. I didn't want to eat. I didn't want to be bothered. I didn't like people when they had their kids. I hated when people kids graduated. I didn't want to see none of that. So I stayed off of social media, kids getting ready for prom. I don't want to see that. I don't want to see that. Wow. Because I wanted that. Wow. I deserved it. I deserved that. I wanted my son to get married and see me get married. And then I didn't want to graduate past. I didn't want to do anything for my son because my son was my number one saying so I didn't want to succeed in life because who was going to be there for me I didn't think no, I would have nobody because my son was all was everything to me he was my partner and just like Tony said I she just our kids deserve to grow up and do stuff 
they deserved it. My son was 19. Tanya, I'm interested to hear your your take on that as well. Uh, I'm going to get back to Fred. Are you still there? Yeah, I'm here. Wow, that that that. Thank you for sharing, man. That that, that that's a powerful, powerful statement uh, that you made. I want to get back to you to talk a little bit about that suppression. Um, Tanya, I'm interested to hear. I, I heard Sharnice's voice on that suppression uh, when she lost her two sons. She lost herself, but when it happened to her. She went on the move. She just, I guess, much like Fred, just wouldn't let it keep her down. Um, you, you had two young children that you had to fight for in the midst of losing your older daughter. Talk a little bit about that suppression and how it affected you, uh, Tanya. I wasn't able to do that. That's the difference with uh, our, our stories. I couldn't do that. I couldn't suppress wow. it. Like you knew when I was hurting, I would cry. I would I would be depressed. I wouldn't put on makeup. I wouldn't do my hair. Like no, I I, you know how everybody be like, oh I'm gonna keep it moving and I'm gonna do no. I couldn't do that. If I was around wow. people when they had their children, I was crying. If I seen people celebrating their happiness, I was hurt. I I would leave and they would be like, where are you going? I'm going home and I would just lay in my bed. Like people seen it, they felt it, they knew it that I was going through it. But I wasn't so, abandoned, but it just felt like your love wasn't good enough for me. My support wasn't good. It just wasn't good enough for me because I was hurting so bad. One thing I'm learning from this conversation is that the symptoms of depression might be the same, but people handle those symptoms differently. All yeah. of us may have had the same symptoms, but we don't respond to them the same way. And that's that's something that I think we might need to really talk about because it suggests that there's no blank check that, you know, there's no car blanche to coming out of this. We can come out, but we might come out different pathways. And so um, for Tanya, um, it wasn't something that she could do. Fred, I want to, that, that, that's talk a little bit about that, man. How, how are you able to, to really suppress it. Uh, I, I know you, you come from Philly, um, you know, and I think you were the oldest, right? You were, you were the oldest. Right. Okay. Right. Um, and that, and that, that has to play a lot with it. Um, I think, you know, so, um, again, uh, I don't know if I shared, I lost a, a son as well at six months. So I don't know if everybody, I don't, I think Tanya probably is the only person that knows about that particular situation because I shared that, but I think, you know, um, and also to, Say that again. You lost your mom and you lost a son at six months. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Two, 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 two SIDS. Um. So oh, you know, that man. was another thing that um I had to suppress. But I think that as I, I think what helped with that um when my mom passed um that was I was in the military so you still got to function you still got to do the mission you you know you still have to you know, lead troops, you still have to, um, be a leader and you, you know, you, you can't, that, that can cause somebody's death that can, you know, so I had to, a different lifestyle at that time that I had to continue on and, and, and get back in the swing of things. And, you know, from a military standpoint, um, cause it could cost somebody life, you know, if you're not in the right mindset or if you're depressed or, you know, you can't lead, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll take you out of those particular situations um, and the fear of that as well. So I had to get those things together and keep moving. So I think that's one way that I had to, to deal with that um, moving forward. Um, and, and also just dealing with just trauma, you know, throughout life, um, mm. you know, things happen and people getting killed, you know, over and over and over again. I think you start to get numb to situations and scenarios over and over and over again. So um, what I had to do with my mom is, um, and I think Tanya kind of alluded to it, you know, what, what people say, you know, you, you know, everything's going to be okay. You know, you, you, um, you know, she's in a better place. So I took that perspective. Um, my mom, it was like hell on earth for my mom, you know, dealing with her, her addiction and dealing with drugs and dealing with, you know, having four boys and, 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 and being in that time, you know, we in better times now, but during that time frame, having four boys and, and being on welfare and, you know, raising these kids and, and these, in these circumstances situation, as I looked at it, I kind of looked at it like, okay, she don't got to suffer no more. You know, she don't have to go through life like this no more. You know, you know, nobody's not trying to harm her. She's not her harming herself. 
So I took that perspective on it, you know, throughout the whole time frame. So it helped wow. me as well, you know, to, 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 to suppress those things, you know, that, you know, I was, I was dealing with. Now, when you say de- suppress, you're not, you're not saying avoidance. You're not saying denial. No, 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 no. Just to, 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 to push those into a place where they're locked and, you know, they, they, they come out in certain time frames, but yeah, I, w- I was just suppressing it where it wouldn't affect me mentally or it would, it would cause someone else, you know, to, to not be able to function. Cause again, like I said, I had to be a leader. So I had to put those things aside. Well, one thing that seems to be having yeah. common is that all, all of you lost children. I mean, um, I think, I think, uh, Sharnice says she lost her mom, if I'm not mistaken. Fred, you lost your mom. You lost a son. Um, Sharnice lost two sons. Uh, Tanya lost her daughter. And, and so we have this common thread of, of suffering in silence through, through the pain of, 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 of personal loss. And, um, Earlier, um, Fred, I, wanna, I, I, I didn't know you lost a son. I'm, I'm interested in, and I'm going to come back. I'm going to go back to something we talked about earlier. Earlier, we talked about the guilt complex, and um, T- Tanya said something I thought was so profound. She said she she felt guilty for living when when her daughter died. Mm-hmm. Seeing that you lost a son at six months, is that something you dealt with uh, the guilt aspect of it, Fred? Yeah, I, I definitely um, I dealt with some guilt. Um, you, you know, you start looking at things from perspective. You should have been there to protect that child. You know, you mm. needed to be there with the mom. Um, you know, you, you question some things, but you know, at the time, you know, I was connected with spiritually, and I, and I knew that it was something. I, I just leaned on that. I leaned on that understanding that you know. This is something that I, I, I dealt with it a little bit differently. You know, I said this is something that was beyond my control. You know what I mean, or whatever the case may be. This, this, this child was an angel, so I came from that perspective, and I think that you, I did that on purpose so I wouldn't have to deal with more of the guilt of, um, you know, me not being there. You know, I linked on that understanding a lot more. You know, so I didn't have to go through that that, that guilt portion of it. For those who are listening, this is Suffering and Silence. I'm your host, Dr. Larry Walter, and we have our special guest on tonight, uh, Mrs. Tanya Larry. She is the uh, sponsor for a powerful uh, platform here for women in York City called uh, The Power of a Woman. And we have two callers that's really uh, shared some personal, personal uh, testimony on tonight, uh, and they're part of this conversation. We want to definitely keep them on uh, to give their voice uh, for those who are listening outside. Uh, we have Fred and Sharnice both called in sharing some very powerful and personal testimonies about um, overcoming. Um, Tanya, um, you, you, you've, you've definitely um, been an inspiration to so many women here in, in York in terms of what you've uh, done. A lot of times people are in distress and they reach out to you. I know many times um, you're one of the first people that uh, people here in the city in distress call on. Um, what, what has become your motivation? Um, to be there. You mentioned earlier about going hard for others, and I would like to hear that from Fred and, and, and Sharnice as well. The, the, what, what continues to cause you to want to do what you do for women in particular, uh, Tanya? Um, because I see their children also struggling as well. Like we focus on the mothers, but I also focus on the fathers too. You know, a lot of men reach out because they're like, how do you do it? How do you sleep at night? How do you get through this? And I tell them there's no there's no time limit on grieving. Men men need us as much as we need them. We have to support them as well. Like, you know, there's a lot of things that's for mothers, but what about the fathers? So when mm. I say that I go I go hard for like the whole entire family. The children are watching us and listening. They're hearing everything that we're saying. They're seeing the, they're watching TV, seeing the murders. Um, they're witnessing it on their, on their streets that they live on. You know, a lot of our children are suffering from post-traumatic stress as well. Mm. So my thing is, if a mother could go on hard times, I want things to be right for them. I'm like, hey, if you don't want therapy, 
there's churches that have open arms. You can go talk to anyone. And you're like at the top of my list, um, Pastor Joel. Like there's a lot of people, Adrian Boxley. Like I can name a lot of people that, you know, are just waiting to help people. But like you said, the pastors go through things as well. So sometimes mm-hmm. you got to check on a pastor and be like, how are you doing today? How are things going for you? And you know, See, my um, way of thinking is different now because I know what it's like to suffer a tragic loss. You know, you can you can lose other family members when it, when it's yours. It's a whole different feeling. So this depression that I have, I don't want people to feel like I felt. I want them to take it one day at a one hour at a time, and I want them to seek help, like you like your niece and you said, if it's through God or if it's through a therapist. But the people have to make you feel like you can trust them. So that's why I do what I do for people, because I know what it's like to go through pain and suffering and just feel like you're just, you're, you're done with life. And that's not how you want to feel, but that's how you feel. Fred, I want to, I want to ask you something and, and, and bring Sharnice in uh, as well. Um we talked about, and I think Tanya made a very key point, particularly when it talks about having a platform of trust. And I know a lot of times um, in our own lives, people ask us how we're doing, and we say, you know, for the most part, we're good. And we really don't have honest honesty about how we feel. Um, talk a little bit about um, Fred and Sharnice about getting to a place where you can be honest that if you're having a bad day to say, you know what, I, I'm just not feeling it today. You know, today is not a good day for me. Um, or, you know, uh, uh, lift me up, Doc. Uh, or, or, or talk a little bit about the honesty of the conversation, because I think a lot of times we wear a mask as we're suffering in silence. It's funny. Um, you know, um, it's still tough. You know, it's still tough. I've, I've, um, I've, been, a, I've been a very private person for a very long time. Mm. Um, um, and, and, and as, you know, some people know that, you know, I was divorced before and I had a, a situation here, um, that, um, I was, I was embarrassed. Um, and, um, you know, I, I never want to talk about, you know, those situations. And, and, and for me, I'll continue. Sometimes you have, sometimes I feel like you have to have a mask because, you know, sometimes people, I feel like sometimes people in the community try to take advantage of that 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 weakness. Um, so and I have confidence in people that I will and they know mm. that, I'll, that I could be honest with and talk to. But you know, for the public, I don't I don't take that same route. Um, for me, you know, and everybody else may be different, but there's only a select few that I would really say, hey, listen, yeah, I'm, I'm not doing good right now. I'm not. I'm not in the best shape or, you know, I got some things going on and, you know, that I would really schedule a time frame to talk to them. But, you know, I've, I've always had that, um, personal, personal privacy, um, throughout, um, because, you know, just moving around and, and, and dealing with different people, I think that people will, will try to take advantage of that, um, you know, sure. as you, as you continue to try to help people. If I'm hearing you correctly, you have accountability partners. You have people in your life specifically Absolutely. for that purpose. Right. Wow. Right, right. And it's limited. Wow. It's very it's very it's very limited. Not too many people, you know, you can talk to about that, that you know that have your back and that you can really, you know, count on that give you one hundred percent good feedback or, or motivate you or, you know, that really knows you. I think I struggled after my mom passed, I struggled um talking to people because I felt like it would take too much for them to understand who I am and where I come from. So I struggled for a long time with that that trust issue because I could just go to my mom and be like, Mom, I'm having this issue with, you know, da-da-da, and she'll know me. She'll know that I mean well. She'll know that I didn't mean any harm or I didn't mean any, you know, um, 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 misfortune for anybody. You know what I mean? What, without you having to kind of go back and forth. So, you know, for a long time, I just, you know, I, I didn't utilize that. And as I got through the military and, you know, um, you know, learned different relationships and had different relationships, you know, then I, then I opened up. Wow. That's, that's, that's powerful. Um, Sharnice, how, 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 how is your take on that, that, that honest conversation 
Fred makes a very key point about having accountability partners. Is that something that you've learned how to have in your life as well, or are you still at a point where you just private about where you are? I'm half and half. I um I'm more so I pick and choose who I want to share, and I uh I can tell. I can tell now and before because I can think. I never could be, I never was able to think. So I can pick and choose who I want to share my story with and who who just want to tell somebody else or talk about me. So I, I'm now more reserved in who I talk to now. Like before, I wanted I just wanted all of this off of me so I would tell anybody who was listening. Now, mm. you, I'm not giving it to anybody. I'm just not giving it to any old and everybody. So I'm receptacle now who I have conversations with other than my group. And I like, you know, everybody don't really want to hear it, you know. They just there. And I got a lot of uh, negative things when I would, you know, go to people or, you know, when I was having a hard time because I didn't understand it. So I just hold on, Pastor, and just pray. I come home and I talk to God more than I've ever probably talked to God in my life. Everything I do, I go to God and I wait and I wait, I wait, I wait, I wait. So if I don't get an answer then, I just wait. And then if the answer don't come, then that's when I'm flying through your door asking, can you, can I tell you something? <laughs> 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 so I missed it. I come around there to you and see if you can help me with the situation. I stopped running to people, and I believe that that was my part. God wanted me to come to him. And I told Tony that this morning, I'm a special kind of case that man couldn't help me. God wanted wanted to to tell people he made me better because I've always went to man for everything and I never went to him. So he fixed it for me the way the only person could help me was him. And that's why I go there. I didn't went to every man, woman, or anybody. I never went to God. I always went to him last. So now wow. I start I start there. I don't I already shared told what y'all wanted y'all to know as male people. Now I go in my room since I learned from you, I learned from me, I know how that I got the tools too. So I learned that I'm somebody special and I know God's gonna answer me as well. So I go to him for myself. Why why go to the middle man when I know the real man? <laughs> I'm no wow, man. For those- <laughs> <laughs> For those who are listening, this is Suffering in Silence. I'm your host, Dr. Larry Walter. I'm coming to you live from the broadcasting booth. Uh, we have here uh, on with us tonight a very, very robust conversation. We have uh, our guest, our special guest, and two callers that called in. Uh, Mrs. Tanya Larry here, uh, who's a sponsor of a powerful platform uh, here in the city called The Power of a Woman. And uh, it gives voice, uh, value, and vision to women who are really, really uh, in distress and in despair. We have two callers that are still with us, uh, Fred and Sharnice, are uh, called and shared some very powerful stories uh, to our listeners. If you're out there and you listen to this broadcast and you want to be a part of the conversation, you can you can dial 302-202-1110. That's 302-202-1110. Hit the access code 538-661. And we would love to hear from you to be a part of this uh, conversation. Uh, this is Suffering in Silence on the GMAP1 Broadcasting Network. For those who don't know, this is the number one broadcasting network social platform on the planet uh, for inspiration and motivation, hitting 180-plus countries worldwide. So all over the globe, we want to thank you for tuning in tonight, Suffering in Silence. Um, Tanya, you, 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 you started this conversation uh, off, and um, Shanice, and I know, Fred, you're a person of faith. I want to try to... Uh, to really um, dovetail this because it, it all comes down to your faith, um, your faith walk. And, and Sharnice made a very powerful, I thought, insight about this situation has caused her faith to increase to a point where she now knows how to listen to God for herself. Um, but for those who might not be there, and I do advocate Christian counseling. I know, uh, Fred, your wife is a, is a Christian uh, psychologist. Uh, therapist counselor does a tremendous job here in the in the area with uh, therapy. So uh, I, I want to go on record uh, for those who are listening. I do believe in Christian counseling. I do believe that uh, as a believer in the body of Christ, you can have therapy and yet have a testimony. You can have Christ 
and and yet have a uh, have 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 a counselor. Um, but 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 uh, Tanya, you 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 started this conversation off by being a, a native Yorker, uh, losing a child at age 18, uh, being there for so many others, uh, and you talked about women and men who are grieving. Um, what would you say to that person listening to your voice tonight that's at a place of despair? Um, to to give them the hope in the midst of a hopeless situation? Um, I would tell them to seek God first. Um, If they believe Mm. in God, just pray. And then um, find a church that you feel comfortable with. And uh, get, you know, talk. That's counseling. If you don't understand, if you go to a pastor or if you go to God, that's counseling right there. Go to the Bible. Mm. Read scriptures. So counseling doesn't always have to be someone that got a degree that can write a prescription and give you medicine. That's not always the case. So I feel as someone that's lost or going through something that's really grieving and hurting and their mind isn't uh, focused enough to um, reach out to other people, I think they should just, you know, um, seek God first. Wow. Wow. Fred, you you, you mentioned... Um, you know, being in the military and, and you shared your story about your son, Doc, and I, I, I never knew, man, uh, that's, that, that's, that's just so powerful and personal. Uh, how, how were you able, I know you talked about suppressing it and, and really you can only suppress things for so long before it comes to a point where you have to uh, deal with it uh, or it, it will deal with you. And I know your involvement here in the community and what you're involved with and here at, at, you know, at Shiloh and other places. Um, How have you been able to stay focused with the loss of your mother, the loss of a son and so many other things that you're facing? What's been the key to you being able to stay focused? You know, I think um, I used it as a strength. Um, I I wasn't destined to be in the positions that I'm in or the places where I'm at. Um, so I take, I took that trauma and that turmoil and those tragedies and I applied it to, um, focus on other things and and different things. So I'll give you an example. I have three other brothers. Um, they dealt with it differently. Um, one of my brothers went into a deep depression, um, continued to keep getting locked up. Two of them, two of them. Um, we all have different fathers that, you know, and the, and the, and the two brothers, um, had great fathers and leadership, and I saw what it done. I saw what that done to my brother, and he fell off. They both are in jail right now. So I, I looked at those things as like, to me, these are the things because you you look at people. You know, when things happen, tragedies happen in certain people's families. Is either two things are going to happen? Either they're going to you know fall into a deep depression and just say forget everything. I'm not going to do anything, and then you know they they they. You know they're falling off. That you know they're not taking care of themselves. They're not mm. getting help. They're not getting anything. And then you see them wither away, or they they die off, or you know they come to a point where you know they become suicidal, or you know they become a, a menace to society, whatever that is. Yeah. You know. So I saw that part of it. Um, so I took that and I took it and just made it a strength. Um, you mentioned something else about. You know, when do I have to deal with it? Um, it's funny. Um, you know, I, I know you all know I have my, my youngest daughter. And one day I was taking her to school, and um, it was uh, the song called, from Sounds of Blackness, Pastor. You know, it came on in your office, and you seen me go through that process um, of, of, yeah. of dealing with that. So um, was, I can't think of the, with the name. I'm going all the way. Whatever it takes, I'm going all the way. No, not that one. It's the sound of blackness, and it's um, I can't think of what the name of the song is, but the sound of blackness. And the song came on while we were in the car. I was taking my daughter to school, mm-hmm. and um, I had to uh, I had to explain to her what that song meant, um, and help her understand what it meant. And my mom used to sing that song to me, and and how I remember it. So you know, I went through an emotional state at that time with her in the car you know, like something was talking to me, like somebody was saying something to me. And, um, you know, I went and dropped her off and I came home and, um, you know, Dr. J was upstairs and I was in my office and I just poured out crying. You know what I mean? Like I was just, it was just, oh, I couldn't stop. You know what I mean? Like I just continued to keep crying because I heard, I heard this, I heard this, 
the song, and um, I was trying to. It was like, you know, my mom was telling me to explain that to my to my daughter, and um, you know, it was I had to deal with it right then. And then I go through those first. Um, there's another song by um, R. Kelly, you know, and, and these are things I'm quite sure everybody on the phone go through. It's, it's called um, uh, I Wish. Um, so oh. that makes me. That's another song that makes mm-hmm. me think about my mom. Um, and, and just, you know, it, it, it correlates to my life, just playing basketball and wishing she was here and, and, and going through life situations and looking up to her and talking to her, you know, and I asked her, he has a part where he's talking to his mom and, um, she says something to him, you know, I remember going through situations in the military and, you know, feeling by myself and wanting to go to her and ask her about those things. So, yeah, you know, you suppress it to a, to an extent until you know some some things happen or occur in your life so yeah. wow for those who are listening this is suffering in silence and i'm quite, quite sure you know we used to go to the nine o'clock hour but our executive producer has given us some more time tonight because of the robustness of this conversation uh we're going to go to uh 8 30 uh our time here um uh, 9 30 um our time here 8 30 in the central uh, time zone. So if our if our host, if our guest and our two callers can still stay on, uh, we're going to go to the to the uh, 8:30 hour. Um, for those who are listening, if you want to call in and be a part of this conversation, you can dial 302-202-1110. Uh, hit the access code 538661. We would love to have your voice to be a part of this conversation. Share your story, ask a question, uh, give a comment, or share some concerns. We're talking about suffering in silence, uh, and that you don't have to have uh, uh, be without a voice uh, in the times of despair that uh, the best thing you can do when you're going through a dry season is to find people you can talk about. And I like what Fred talks about having accountability partners. Um, Fred, you just talked about, um, you know, having those moments and, and how reflections and a song and things like that. Uh, Shawnice, um, what's, what's yes, been the key to you, being focused uh, in the midst of losing your mom and losing two sons um, to, to streets to the streets, what's what's been your motivation for staying focused? My grandson. Mm. My grandson, um, <clears throat> which I have four, but my oldest grandson is ten. So at this time, he was there through it all. And my oldest grandson, and I said to Tony Lowry yesterday, my oldest grandson's name is Darius, which is my son's name, and he looks like my baby boy. So I just was a blessing. That's a blessing to me that I get to call my son's name and look at my children because my grandson looks exactly like my son. But I don't uh, make him um, do anything because I haven't taught my grandson anything of uh, which I taught my kids, but this little boy, um, Pastor, and I think I've shared with Fred and, and my kids, he saved my life. Because I, I wow. probably would have, uh, that day I was out there in the woods and I, I contemplated on driving my car off 83 because I was like, Tony said, why am I still here, God? Let me go. And I looked back to pull my car off to go over the 83 bridge and that car seat was right there. And I knew he would be waiting for me. And he always used to say, it's just me and you, but but you won't be back. What time you won't be back? And I would write on his uh, paper at school what time I would be back. And if I was a minute late, he'll have somebody call me. So I didn't want him to wait for me. And I never wanted to do what was done to me because I wanted my mother. And I knew that my grandbaby loved me and he would look for me. He would want to have, want, want me there. So I never wanted to inflict that pain on him. If I die because I have to die, that's a different story. But to die because I ended my life, I never wanted to break my grandson's heart. Not to say I don't love my daughter, but she could have found a way. But my grandson, I didn't want to hurt him. And I knew that he would wait for me. And he saved my life. And I tell anybody, if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't probably be around because I was on my last and that string was getting short. I don't know how much more I could take. Like, you know, that was it for me. My grandbaby saved my life and it got me to want to be what I needed to be and love me. And I see 
he couldn't sit here and keep sitting in the house. So I had to take him out so he can heal. You know, I had to get outside and go play ball and help him meet friends so we can sit here all the time. So my grandson, Darius, inspired me to try to get myself together and be a better person. And that's not wow. about to really want to love myself. My grandbaby helped me. One of the one of the key points of, 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 of being a person of faith is the word of God. And Tanya, you mentioned this about uh, all counseling might not be sitting in, son, in front of a therapist, but getting counseling from the word of God, um, reading that, because I do believe every time we open God's word, he's speaking to us um, um, eternally. He's, he's always speaking to us. Um, and one of the, one of the treasures that we have in scripture is that many of the people that we preach about on a regular basis dealt with depression. And I think this conversation has to be elevated within the context of the church that, um, we have to be a sounding board of, of hope and, 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 and be honest about the fact that, um, even, even Jesus felt abandoned. On the cross, he asked the Father, oh, "My God, My God, why has Thou forsaken me?" And th- and there are two things that I think we do a disservice, and I would like all of you all to give uh, some light on this. I think we do people a, a disservice when we tell them, "Don't ask God why." I, I don't believe God is intimidated by our whys. Uh, he may not always respond when we want to to the why. But there are there are there are numerous people in the Bible that ask God why. Jesus asked God why. Moses asked God why. David asked God why. Elijah asked God why. Jeremiah asked God why. And I think we do um, people a disservice because it is in dealing with the why that we are able to come to a better place, not necessarily of understanding or even acceptance, but sometimes it is the pathway to closure. And I don't mean closure to the extent that you're forgetting, uh, but you're able to forge ahead. What 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 has been um the testament of, of your faith? And I, I would like for all of you to just share a tidbit about how God's word and how your relationship with God has has helped you uh get from where you were to where you are, because I think as believers, it is, it is, the word says we overcome by our testimony and by the word of the lamb. So um, I'm going to start with Fred, and then we'll go from Fred to Sharnice to Tanya. Um, how did it, how did it help me? Um, You know, my faith was, um, you know, I, I like how you said, it. it's funny because I never even challenged that statement when people used to say that. You know, don't ask God why, and I think that I never challenged it because I heard it so much, and I heard it from elders, and I heard it from mm-hmm. so many different people. Um, so I never challenged it. So you know, for you to give that that perspective and change it around and say, hey, look, God isn't intimidated why you asking why. Um, so I I can't speak to to that. I know that maybe you know Shanice and Tanya may have you know experienced that. I was the one that was just um, being obedient and saying, you know, and I'm not going to even ask that. I'm going to just, you know, take it as this. And that's how, again, that's how I dealt with it. But um, um, I think after my mom, I mean, looking off and then I'm looking at her, her baptism and, you know, her picture and stuff like that, after her pa- passing, I think that I started getting, you know, I was, uh, I was younger going to church um, and understanding, you know, specific things. Um, never, I never went to, to, um, 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 to um, Bible study or nothing like that, but you know, I always just looked at it from a prayer perspective. I started praying more. I remember coming back from from uh, Philadelphia and, and uh, flying over to Europe and just just praying about it. And I think that eased um, some of the pain from me. Um, just you know, I felt like I could I could talk to her. I felt like I could talk to God. I felt relieved that you know I could just speak in that aspect. So that's how I feel like for me, that's how it drove me to um, spirituality a lot closer from losing somebody um, and, and, and just having that understanding and not questioning, it. you know, just this is what, what, what God wanted to, you know, wanted to happen. This is this is written. This is ordained. This is how it's, it, it is. You, there's nothing you can do about that. 
Um, so I just was obedient in that aspect. I never, I never asked why. I, I, I just dealt with it. So and I just prayed on it and spoke it. And, you know, that's that's how it relieved some of the pain for me. Hmm. Oh wow, that's deep. Wow. Yeah. Wow. wow. What a powerful insight. That's 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 heavy, man. That's 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 a that's a deep perspective, Doc. Wow. That really is. I I forgot what the question was. I came. Wow. Wow. <laughs> my my question was, what what role has your faith played in in terms of you getting from that place of despair to a place of deliverance? Wow, brother Fred. Um, I don't need um. Ooh. Well, I asked that question because you know I'm the, I'm kind of rebellious, so I asked him. <laughs> why? <laughs> You know, I'm the rebellious one. Lord, why, 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 why? And I thought that was the reason why life wasn't happening because I kept asking why. Yeah, I asked. And um, until I walked through that door, and this is honest, it ain't because y'all are on this phone, and I'm quite sure y'all already know that. I'm going to say whatever I want to say anyway. I didn't know anything about uh, religion or any type of thing or understanding God until I walked around that church and went in the wrong church. I, I, um, uh, then people went through some things. I was in the right church. People, I, I didn't know anything about it. I knew that God had my back and because of stories or anything, but I didn't have any faith or any hope because I had been through too much until I walked into Shallow Baptist Church and I had no intentions on going to Shallow. I just seen people going in the door, so I went in the door. So I never, been a religious or had anything about God on my own until that day I searched and I tried to go places and it wasn't for me but to take initiative to go to a woman's group school to anything that my pastor or my brothers and sisters are having that was different for me so I believe that me walking in the shallow was not an accident and Mm. that's what you told me when I met but I've never been so happy to be about God. And even when I strayed away and had to go to God, because once again, I started and I didn't tell you why I had to back up. I started going to church because I started needing things from people. And I didn't come to church to meet the need people. I came to get the word from God so that I wouldn't run away. So once people give me past a, a different kind of look or shun, I run because I talk back still and I might say something wrong. So I had to remember the reason that God sent me through your door was to get to know him. Not people was a plus, but that wasn't why I was there. So I had to remember, stay home and go back and remember why I was fast and why I was doing all these things. It was to get close to God. Friends was going to be next somewhere, but that wasn't intentions where he had me to come and get service for. It was to get to know him, not man and woman, him. So that's what happened. I didn't know anything about anything until I stepped into your church, into you minister me, and to my brother Fred, I would call him and y'all minister me because y'all are two men that I allowed to get to me to a place because of all the abuse that I've been through. So when I went out, I didn't feel as though that y'all would lead me astray. I trust your judgment. I trust, hey, should I do this? Should I work here? Should I do that? I came to y'all with everything. And I never let no man leave me. No man you, can tell me nothing. You bring up a key word that I don't think we've really addressed tonight. You talked about abuse. And I know that uh, abuse and depression are in the same vein that um, you almost can't have one without a, without the other. Yes, sir. You, you, you talked about coming from a life of abuse and and having those walls up because of being abused. There may be somebody listening to your voice right now that's at a place of abuse. What would you say to them? It's not your fault. It's not your fault. There was nothing you could have did different. It wasn't wow. the church you were in. 
it wasn't the way you moved or nothing you did. It wasn't your fault. I was molested from the age of four to 12. So I know I wasn't looking that good at four to nobody. I shouldn't have been anyway, but it's not your fault. And that's the thing that people who touch you make you believe it's your fault. You should have did this. And if you wasn't that, and this was that. It's not your fault. And tell somebody. Tell somebody. Whether they tell you somebody, just tell somebody. Tell somebody. Tell somebody. This, this is Suffering in Silence. I'm your host, Dr. Larry Walter. And we're having a awful conversation on so many topics. Um, tonight, abuse, depression, suicide molestation, hopelessness, despair. If you're listening on the other side of this conversation and you want to be a part of this conversation, we have a very special guest tonight, uh, Ms. Tanya Larry. She is the uh, sponsor for a platform here for uh, women, giving them uh, value, vision, and a voice called The Power of a Woman. We have two callers that called in on tonight, um, Fred and Charnice, who's just given so much to this conversation of really coming to a place of wholeness. If you're listening tonight and you want to be a part of this conversation, I mean, I'm just so overwhelmed. Probably hearing my voice. Contact number is 302-202-1110. Access code 538-661-302-202-1110. Access code 538-661. You want to be a part of this conversation. We encourage you to call in and just be a part of this. Um, one of the most powerful statements tonight I've heard is, it's not your fault. If if you are a victim of abuse, you're dealing with depression, you're dealing with molestation, mm-hmm. you're dealing with becoming a victim of somebody else's power and control, um, remember, um, it's not your fault. Um, Shawnee, I'm going to uh, con- allow you to continue I just received word from my executive producer, and this is solely up to you all. Uh, He's in Chicago listening to this conversation, and uh, the dynamics have gone so. We got people listening who may not even be calling in, but they're listening. So he's giving us some more time. (coughs) Excuse me. So um, he's giving us an extra half hour. We don't have to use the time, but if if it's available. So if you all want to go, that's available to us, or we can close out anywhere between 8.30 and 9 o'clock. For those who are listening, this is Suffering in Silence. I'm your host, Dr. Larry Walter. This is the extended version on tonight. We're having a very powerful conversation um, with uh, Mrs. Tanya Larry here in York, Pennsylvania. So, Anissa, I'm going to turn it over to you so you can continue that thought, and then I want to hear back from uh, from Tanya about um, Suffering in Silence. So, Um, You know, I didn't have anyone. I had... um. I never shared this, God knows. I never shared this with anybody. And this is why I uh, I had uh, I was twelve, and I told this was the first time me telling out because I know that's wrong. So when I told, uh, I wasn't able to eat at home. People treated me mean. I was getting beat because I told and the person who touched me wasn't supposed to live in a house with me. And mm. my grandmother has said to me, I will never forget it, word for word, you're not mine, he is mine. You're only here because your mother died and don't nobody else want you. Wow. Oh, wow. Sure. So those, um, you remember was, those words. Those words stayed with you from the time that she said them until now. Yes, because she said it to me often. So that I so that day I couldn't eat at the house and my um family mom they would buy me food or whatever. So I went downtown where Lexington Market is, everybody knows. I used to buy a lot of nice jewelry and I went to the jewelry store and got me a fake ID and I went and got me a job and I went and gave the man number at the jewelry store, McDonald's phone number. And he act like he was 
somebody and I and I took a uh, forgive me Lord I took a uh, a work permit from school and I got my counselor person to fill it out and I signed it I told her I didn't want to get in trouble I I forged her signature and I went and got me a job at McDonald's from that day you ain't got to never worry about me being hungry I'm eating as much food as I want to eat because I work here and ever since that day Pastor, I never allowed anyone to dictate how I can do, when I can do. I've always had my own, and I never let nobody ever think that I needed them when I did, you know, because she took every, that day, she took something from me, and she let me know that I really didn't have anybody. I was just here because my mom died, and I didn't have anywhere to go. And then that's when I always say, late at night, well, outside, sure would feel good right now, and I'd rather be homeless than live here. And and I shared it with Tanya, Pastor. People don't know what abuse is because I wore the finest clothes, diamond rings, fur coats, leather pants. So who was going to actually believe that I was being abused in those times in the 80s, Pastor? No one. I didn't have no bruises on me. But every night I'll go to bed with somebody pulling off my, excuse me, my panties and touching me. But no one, no one, and I couldn't go no way because she would thought I was going to tell somebody, so I stayed punished. Like, I never could go to people's house. I could never go anywhere. And that's because now now I know I'm not acting like I knew before. Now that was the reason why I couldn't go no way because nobody wanted me to tell. Wow. So, so you got your I'm voice back. Mm. Sir. You got your voice back. You got your voice and uh you didn't let it defeat you. And and there are so many other young ladies that that story is their story. That what you just described has been their story, and there's somebody out there tonight. That's their story. Um you you mentioned and then I'm gonna I'm going to bring Tanya in because um, I want to hear from you about your faith and how that drives you to stay focused. But you mentioned that you told. And when you told, it seemed like your family turned on you, for lack of a better well, term. Well, I, I had a friend, which is my cousin, and she was the same age as me. And I ran over her house, and I told her. And okay. she called her mom, and she told my Aunt Jackie. And they called the police. So, you know, back in those days, what stays in this house, stay in this house. So I wow. committed an awful sin. So my aunt and them called the police, and they went to court, and they showed up, and they told him and that he could never be in a home with me or any of that. And then my grandmother, and then they was asking me about other things, and she told me, I better not say nothing else about in this house. So when they was to ask me, did he be there, um, my appointments and counseling seat. I was never available to um, come to the house. So the lady I had, I would never, I never forget her. She would come over, and as I want to say, my parents didn't fit the abuse. You know, I had on some hot pink leather pants. You hear me telling you, you would have liked them, and I had a cashmere sweat on. Pass it, and the lady said, "You gonna give up all of this?" Wow. wow. My parents couldn't get me no help. So if I would have had a black, just even kids who get broken arms, you don't get the help that you need. I think that's like the easiest thing is to hurt a kid before somebody knows that something is real. So because I look nice and I had dinner every day, uh, I made it up. You was no, living a lot. It, you you was wearing a mask, really. Um, you you were wearing a mask, and that's and that's where so many people who are suffering in silence. They uh, there's a there's a powerful uh, poem um, that was written. It's entitled "We Wear the Mask," and uh, so many people are wearing masks today. Um, and, and and to see them, you, you would never know they were hurting. You know, listening to your story, 
you, you would never know that you were you were hurting to that extent. Um, yeah. And and it's 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 the just just the mask and and it goes back to what Paul Lawrence Dunbar talked about um, wearing the mask because we really don't want people to know who we really are. Uh, that mask, it grins and lies. It hides our cheeks and shades our eyes. You know, so, so many people who are suffering in silence, and I want to bring you in, Tanya, on this about your faith. Um, suffering in silence, and you talked about how you, as an individual, know so many women who are suffering in silence. Uh, Sharnice talked about her faith, you know, going to God in this time and, and, understanding it as not your fault, going through the abuse process, and Fred talked about his faith walk. Share, share about your faith. How, how, what role has your faith played um, in, in you surviving um, and going from the place of darkness to the place of deliverance, uh, Tanya? My story is a little different. I did question God. I was very angry when I lost my daughter. Um, you know, as a child, you're told not to question God at all. So I was mm-hmm. like, if I can't be mad at God, I'm going to be mad at the angels then. Because I felt as though they should have been protecting my daughter as well. You know, they say God would give you um, too much that you can't um, carry, like a burden you can't carry. The burden yeah. of my daughter's death almost destroyed me. Like, your mom... I, I, I keep going back to this about my mental, like that literally destroyed me and I was angry. I was mad. And then I felt like people always have the devil looking like this red man with horns. I felt, I felt him trying to take over my soul to make me angry, bitter, have this hatred. And I was like, no, I can't go down that path. Wow. I can't go down that path. I don't want to feel like that because I know that my heart is filled with love. Mm. And God is going to get me through this. Because love, love is really powerful. Love is very powerful. And a lot of people, if they don't know what love is, I feel sorry for them because even though I come, I came from a battered household, my mother was abused by my stepfather constantly. But no matter what, mm. she always showed us love and support. Wow. So God was always in our house. Like, my mom always was like, pray. And I'm looking at her like, pray, you got a black eye. Something going wrong, pray. Because I had asthma real severely from birth, and my brother Mac had the sickle cell disease, which he was born uh, from incest. My mother was raped when she was 14 years old <laughs> by a family member. So, like, I know a lot of things how, you know, you it, your mind can be destroyed by things, but you still have to overcome it, but it's still there. Mm. Mm-hmm. So faith is wow. powerful. You have to have faith in a lot of things. Like, like Sharni says, she really didn't know God. That's deep, because I knew God from day one. I, I, you know, in certain households, you meet God as a child, and you just be like, okay, I'm trying, I'm going to try to live my, my life right and do good things, but why do bad things happen to good people? One of the things that one of the things that we I come to grips with, and I write about this, is that I too was angry, and a lot of times we're not angry, we're not honest with our emotions toward God, even though we know God knows that God knows how we feel. Um, I, I, when I went through my depression, I can testify that I was angry with God. I I, I was angry. Um, but even though I was angry with God, I never stopped loving him. And I think that's what we have to reconcile that being angry, it's like being angry with our children or being angry with our parents. It does not mean we don't love them. And, and, um, in my anger, my anger toward God in my season of depression taught me lessons about myself that I would have never learned. Um, and it was through that process that I began to understand that I can ask God why, and that God is not intimidated nor insulted by a why question. You know, um, 
the Job asked God why, you know, and and it it took several chapters, but when God finally showed up and and dealt with Job, Job, he said, Job, stand up like a man. You want to know why? Stand stand up like a man. And after God dealt with Job, Job like this is more than what I asked for, and it 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 changed his whole perception of what he was going through. And I think there's a sense of health. As, as twisted as, as this might sound, I, I think when we look at biblical characters whose stories are there to learn, to learn from, there's a, there's a type of health, H-E-L, H-E-A-L-T-H, associated with understanding that I can be upset with God emotionally and yet love him unconditionally. Right. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And I had to learn that. Wow. And uh, listening, listening to Fred, uh, Fred just really knocked the ball out the park. But, but um, I, I had to learn that. And, 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 and another thing I learned, Tanya, was this, was that God was not upset with me about being upset with him. He still loved me. And I, yeah, right. I think that, I think that's, for me, that's that's how my faith um, played in my five-year journey through depression. That that and 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 I grew up in a in a domestic violence situation. You talk about domestic, I, you know, um, I, I had some challenges. My sister and I had challenges growing up, and uh, I had to come to a place, even for many years, with you know what I saw in my house, you know, um, with my dad. You know, I had to come to a place of, of, of reconciliation and, I, you know, and loving him, you know, and understanding that everything was not as what I saw. So I, I think when we come to these places of depression and despair, um, we all have the symptoms, but we, they affect us differently. And uh, Tanya, I think that that that's so powerful what you just said, uh, that you were angry and you're honest about the anger. Yeah, I was. I really was. And like you said, God loves us no matter what. So I had to change my way of thinking, and I had to change the process of how I was living with my depression. Because wow. you got to, like, when my daughter died, it brought up everything from my past to my present. It was like mm. a whirlwind. Like, everything was just falling apart. The peace at home as a child, the stress I went through when I got married at a young age, um, having a baby that was sick, just everything. I was like, why me? Why now? Why? So the things that I do now to try to be positive and try to help other people, it really helps my state of mind. It helps my, my heart heal. Like, I love seeing other people just smile or give a hug because you made their day. Wow. For those who are listening, this is Suffering in Silence. I'm your host, Dr. Larry Walter. I'm coming to you live from the broadcasting booth here in York, Pennsylvania. We have here uh, a, lo- a, a local uh, native uh, young lady doing a powerful, powerful thing here in York. She has a great vision and a great voice in this area, and she is making a, a, a huge difference here. Uh, she is the sponsor of, of uh, The Power of a Woman here in York, which is a community platform of giving women uh, who are in despair uh, just a, a, a understanding of value, vision, and a voice. And she's just sharing her story on tonight, and we've just had some some breakthrough moments. We also have two callers that, that called in on tonight, uh, Fred and Sharnice, who really just added to the flavor of this conversation and just, I mean, just took it to a whole other level. If you're listening on tonight and you uh, want to be a part of this discussion, this conversation, you can dial 302-202-1110, access code 538-661, and we would love to hear from you. We want to give a shout out to our executive producer, uh, Mr. Pastor, rather, Pastor Kevin Schrouder, executive producer, holding it down in Chi-Town. For this extra uh, time on tonight, this is Suffering ex- suffering in Silence extended version. And uh, we're just having some real, real life talk about uh, so many uh, issues 
Uh, I want to get back um, to, to this um, conversation. Uh, Tanya, you talked about what, well, Sharnice talked about uh, the abuse um, a factor. And, uh, and um, Tanya, you talked about the anger factor. Um, when did you come to grips um, of, of seeing God differently where you weren't as angry? Or when did you see the turnaround? I'm interested to hear about when things began to turn around towards your attitude towards God in your anger. Um, when my daughter got pregnant, mm. um, she was a teen mother, and uh, I just wasn't ready for that. And I, I knew then that I wasn't paying enough attention to my children in my time of grief. So that was an wow. eye-opener for me, and then we had to come together as a family. We had a meeting. We all got together because my mom believes in family gatherings and meetings. Like, my mom is really uh, traditional when it comes to having dinners with our whole entire family. So that just brought my heart to be softened when I was like, you know, my child is having a child. It hurt me, but it also made me wake up and be like, you have to be accountable for another life now. So this mm. new life was a blessing, even though she had her early and she struggled in the beginning, but now she's a, um, a healthy 10-year-old little girl um, that suffers from Crohn's disease, but, you know, through prayer and, you know, going through the right cycles, like, we, you know, we got our help with that. Um, that softened my heart a whole lot, being become a grandmother. Wow. It's, it's interesting that you say that because Sharnice had the same – uh, experience, she said her grandchild saved her life um, because yeah. her grandson has her son's name, the oldest son's name, but looks like the baby boy, if I'm not mistaken. And so it's interesting that in both of your lives, your grands um, were your saving grace. Yes. Yeah. I'm interested, uh, Fred, you just you, you knocked it out the park earlier, Doc, uh, with that 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 assessment of um, of really uh, just um, not even asking God why, but just uh, dealing with it um, in the only way that you knew how. Um, when did you when did you see the turnaround um, as you began to get back to a healthy place? for your own, for your own faith walk, um, uh, Fred, if you're still there. Yeah, I think that, um, my turnaround was when I was able to talk about it openly when I was able to tell people, you know, some of my experiences when I saw that, um, I do a lot of my situation to help other people. Um, and it was, you know, it was a slowly but surely process. Um, I would see other people suffering, um, through multiple different things. So, I seen the turnaround after I was able to express it. I seen the turnaround when I was able to help other people, and I saw that um, it was effective. That you know I was able to relate because a lot of times I think what all of us will understand is that you can be more relatable because you've experienced that and you you kind of reconcile and remember what you went through at the time and what's needed for that person. Um, and I think that's what people respect. Um, you come a little bit differently because you had that wall. So um, that's when, how my turnaround began, and that's how I started realizing that I, I was coming out of it and I was able to, um, um, you know, do those things and, and um, you know, help and assist other people. Wow. Wow. So the joy of this conversation is that the turnaround will come is that we may all travel through a place of depression and a place of discouragement and despair, but it's not a place where we can, well, it's not a place that's an ending that we can come out of it. That I like that, uh, Fred, that it, the turnaround will come. And if you're listening on tonight and maybe you're in a place of depression, maybe you're in a place of despair, uh, maybe you, you've been listening to this conversation we've had, some powerful testimonies of individuals who've lost children, lost parents, lost friends, lost their virginity, lost their innocence, but yet victorious. That in the midst of everything we've talked about in terms of losing 
one thing we never lost. We never lost our faith. We never lost our hope. Uh, Tremaine Hawkins sings a song, I Never Lost My Faith. After all I've been through, been rejected, been uh, in some dire situations, lost friends, lost money, lost hope, but I never lost my faith. And if you're listening on tonight, we want you to know that you don't have to suffer in silence. You don't have to be in a place of despair uh, in silence. Uh, Silence is not your friend when it comes to depression. The Word of God tells us that we overcome by the word of our mouth and by the blood of the Lamb. So we've got to be able to talk about it. We've got to open our mouths and change the atmosphere. We've got to speak into the atmosphere. And I'm not just talking about positive affirmation. I'm talking about speaking life into dead situations. Every person who's been a part of this conversation, this is Larry, Fred, and Sharnice, myself, the common thread to all of our loss is that we, we, we had a faith that we held on to. And Paul talked about, I, I, I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I have kept the faith that you've got to fight for the faith. Mm-hmm. So if you're listening on tonight, we want you to know you don't have to give up on God because God never gave up on you. The fact that you're still living tonight, the, st- the fact that you're still breathing, the fact that you're still alive is testament and a testimony that what was designed to kill you did not succeed that your very existence is a testimony, that you are a survivor. Uh, Sharnice reminds us tonight that it's not your fault. If you're dealing with abuse, if you are being abused, have been abused, and you're dealing with the trauma of abuse, it's not your fault. As we prepare to close this conversation, I want to talk and and end up on how to deal with the trauma uh, associated with overcoming, because Depression brings with it trauma, and all of us have dealt with some level of trauma. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close out with Tanya. So, Tanya, you're going to have the final, avoid, uh, final word tonight. And when you come on, make sure you give us information. We would love to give you information if you have a website, web page, uh, email address. Maybe somebody out there would like to uh, reach out to you. So when you, when you give your, your final thought, Tanya, be prepared to give some contact information. But I, w- I want Fred... Uh, Sharnice and then Tanya, talk about the trauma uh, um, that's associated with depression and and how to overcome the trauma. I think I think um, you know everybody who walk is you know totally totally different when dealing with trauma. You know we we um, you know coming from the inner city, you know it's just so much trauma that I don't even, I don't even talk about it or discuss a lot of it. Just some of the things you think. Um, you know, just, you know, it's, you know, and, and, and it's, you know, we all experience it in different ways, um, you know, losing people, killing, um, family members, slaughters, police brutality, and all those different traumas, you know, yeah. kind of, kind of, um, carve you into the person you are today. But I think everybody's mm-hmm. walk is different for me. I think for my, for how I got over my trauma and I think my escape. And I'll be totally honest, and it's weird in a sense, um, is that, um, you know, number, the first thing that got me out of some of the traumas or things that I was dealt with was, was just sports, um, getting away from, you know, a lot of those those thoughts and those situations. And then after, you know, after high school, um, the military um, kind of got me away from a lot of those experiences and traumas that I, that I went through. Um, and mm. it became a lot less, you know, I changed my atmosphere. I changed, you know, wow. um, my, my scope, um, what I was around. Um, so, you know, you gave you that peace and that sanity a little bit. So, you know, I think the further, you know, I was in Germany. So I think what occurred is the trauma became a lot less because people mm. couldn't get to me. People couldn't tell me, people couldn't see me, you know, and I think that I started kind of separating that. Um, and, and, and beginning that piece, a lot of us can't, you know what I mean? A lot of us can't do that. We still got, I think, Shanisa have a story as well. Hers is more like, you know, when she moved away from, from Baltimore and she realized that people couldn't call her to come fight and come do that. You start recognizing those things. You start limiting those those traumas and those situations um, that, are, that occur in your life. So you start separating that. But, um, you know, everybody's, everybody's walk is different. Um, how they overcome it. Um, I linked on success. I linked on um, 
um, working hard. I linked on um, um, mapping out my strategy to come out of those situations. My daughter asked me something. She asked me a, a couple questions today. She said, well, what would be one of the worst places you would never go back to? And I told her Philadelphia. Um, and, mm-hmm. and it's, it's, it's just because it's, it's because it's so much trauma there. I lost my mom. I lost my stepdad. I lost family and cousins. So when I go back to those places, it's different. It's a constant reminder. I would never want to go back to Philadelphia ever. I mean, to live. She asked me like, you know, she, you know, she, she starts to inquire about, you know, the city, and she don't understand, you know, what, you know, why we live where we live at, or why she is in in these particular areas. And I have to explain those things that. There's a lot of things that go on in the city. There's a lot of things that occur, um, and you have to make good decisions now. So and further in your life, you know what I mean, those decisions become better decisions. Um, and um, so, you know, everybody, I think everybody's walk is different as far as, you know, dealing with trauma and mine was, you know, how I got I escaped from it with sports, military, and, um, you know, just working extra hard to try to not go back to those those traumas and those situations that occurred in my life. Wow. That's powerful, man. That's powerful. I like what you said. Sometimes you have to get out the environment. You got to change your atmosphere. Uh, and yeah. and uh, sometimes to survive, you got to leave. Uh, that, that's powerful. Yeah. And, uh, and the people. Funny. And the people, and too. The people. the people, too. Yeah. yeah. That's powerful. Yeah, that really is. Charnice, you yes, still sir. there? Yeah, yeah. Uh, talk, talk a little bit about uh, how you survived some of the trauma that you that you uh, endured. A little same as much as Brother Fred said. I use it up. Uh, everything. I went to my trouble because I lived here, <laughs> so most of it I kept going and going back home, going back home. And I had one time when I was getting myself together, I noticed my behavior. I notice how when I'm home, I'm laid back and chill. When I'm home, I'm poor. I'm ready. I want war with it. I'm I'm ready. I'm on go. You know, I'm I'm ready. So I'm like, wow, I'm angry here. Because just like I lost my mom, both of my kids here, my friends, I am angry here. So when I'm home, I can just smile and be pleasant all the time. Mm. So I keep driving myself to places where I'm really not wanted and unhappy. So once I started fasting and spending time with myself and I enlightened myself, I knew that, hey, I can, you can't go there. That's too much pain. So I, I don't go home as much. I don't do anything that consists of Baltimore too much because that's where all my pain comes from. Wow. So it's very so, similar to what our brother Fred just said about Philadelphia, that you, you basically changed your, your atmosphere and, and changed your surroundings. Um, and, and, and sometimes, you know, to move forward, we just have to, allow some things to be left in the past. Not that you're, you know, not that you're um, abandoning them, but sometimes for your own, your own existence and your own survival. Uh, mm-hmm. I think that's very powerful um, uh, insight to, to how to deal with trauma. And, and for those who are listening, I don't want you to think that we're saying we're avoiding or we're in denial. We're not, we're not in denial. Uh, we're, we're very aware of the trauma um, but but there there is a, uh, a cognitive um, association with being in that same environment and and uh, and uh, the survival of it. Uh, Tanya, uh, I want to th- I want to again thank you so much for your voice on tonight. Uh, you have really been an inspiration to so many. Uh, we'll thank the two callers that called in to really add flavor to this conversation. I want you before you give your final thoughts on uh, surviving the trauma. Uh, Tanya, if you have a website or contact information, maybe somebody out there would like to reach out to you. Uh, the uh, uh, the Power of a Woman uh, uh, Facebook site, if you can give some information about that. And then I would like to give uh, like for you to give us some closing thoughts on um, how you survived uh, the trauma that you dealt with, and uh, and then we're going to uh, have final thoughts 
and uh, prepare to close out. Again, to our executive producer, Kevin Schrauder, thank you so much for this extra time, Doc. Appreciate you for all that you do for GMAT1 Broadcasting Network, the number one motivational inspiration platform on the planet, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 a year. Final thoughts coming from our special guest, Mrs. Tanya Larry. Thank you very much. I want to say that I appreciate Sharnice and Fred and uh, Dr. Walthour. Um, You have been a, a great part of my life. Um, new friends that I met along the, my journey. Um, I have a Facebook page, Tanya Larry. I also, um, I'm a member of the movement. You can also find me there. I help uh, a lot of people throughout the city. Um, Fly is coming soon. That's a page that's going to be made up by Sharnice Bellman. Um, you can also find me on that page coming soon. Um, I just want people to know that it's okay to... Uh, Say your truth. Uh, anything that you're going through, um, don't let nobody make you feel ashamed about being sad, being depressed, or going through a crisis in your life. It, it's a part of life, but you don't have to be stuck there, like the pastor said. You don't have to be stuck in that zone where you don't think nobody will support you or just want to talk to you. Um, trust is uh, earned by a lot of people. You have to uh, be able to trust someone that you want to um, speak to about the things that you're going through so it doesn't be thrown in your face later. So, like I said, our goal, the four of us that I know, um, we want to make that uh, people in York feel comfortable with their environment. Um, Hope Fest was an amazing event that I think that Shallow Church put on this year. Um, I met Fred, yeah, I met Sharnice, like I said, I met Dr. Walker. I appreciate y'all being in my life because Anything that I do, I don't want to do without y'all being a part of it. Amen. So I appreciate Amen. Wow. this platform. I appreciate this platform because, you know, a lot of us, like you said, suffer in silence, but we don't have to anymore. We can reach out to one another, and there's always somebody to talk to. I appreciate the foot soldiers. I, I recommend that men in the city reach out and become a part of this. Um. That's brilliant because, like I said, the men are suffering in silence as well as the women, and you don't have to. Mm. Wow. Like I For said, those who are listening tonight, it's becoming more powerful if we stick together. Amen. That, that great antage for the word team, T-E-A-M. Together, everyone achieves more. Uh, we want to give a shout out again to Mr. Uh, Kevin, Pastor Kevin Stroud, our executive producer in Chi Town, holding it down in Chi Town for the extra time on tonight. Special thanks to uh, Mrs. Tanya Larry, uh, Fred Walker, and Sharnice Selman, who uh, called in on tonight for this special uh, edition of Suffering in Silence. Uh, this broadcast is the backdrop of a book that we wrote by the same title. Uh, I'm a five year survivor. Well, I'm a, I'm a survivor of a five-year season of depression. Uh, and from that, uh, we wrote a book entitled Suffering in Silence. If you're interested in the book, you can go to my Amazon page, uh, go to Amazon, type in my name, Dr. Larry T. Walthour, or type in Suffering in Silence. It will take you to my Amazon page. You can download it to your PDF, or you can order a hard copy, soft, well, a hard copy uh, through Amazon, and it will be sent to you. Also, you can go to my personal website, drltwm. Dot org, drltwm.org. Go to the bookstore and uh, you can download it there to your PDF or you can order uh, a hard copy and it will be sent to you. You can also go to my Facebook page, Dr. Larry T. Walthour Ministries, uh, and hit the blue button. The blue button will take you to my bookstore on my, on my, face, on my website and you can order it there uh, in hard copy or in uh, PDF. And finally, you can go to GMAP1. Uh, broadcasting network that's gmap1.com go to the bookstore book stroll the books go to the blue and white book suffering in silence hit click that and you can download it uh, to your pdf or you can uh, have a hard copy sent to you again this is your host dr larry walter coming to you live from the broadcasting booth suffering in silence and to our executive producer thank you so much for again for the time on tonight uh we're going to give final comments for fred Charnice and uh, and Tanya, and then we're gonna have a closing uh, prayer, and then we're gonna turn it over to our executive producer, Kevin Stroud. Thank you. Um, um, I just want to uh, thank everybody for sharing. Um, I think this is a, again um, just to emphasize what Tanya said. It's an important platform for people 
I uh, hope that more people call in and listen in and, and, and kind of relate to with some of with some you know, some of the people that you may even look to and some of the people that you may be inspired by have been through. And um I hope that some people can um relate and, and have conversation to um you know, get through those processes, get through those those um those traumas, get through, you know, suffering, um in their time of need and, and get seek help, um, you know, seek counseling. Um, you know, find somebody that you can relate to. Again, I don't, I don't, I don't push the, the church aspect on everybody because I know as a, as as I was a kid, you know, people that push that, I kind of put, I kind of drew away from it. So, you know, I want you to be able to relate to me, and then if that's something that I can tell you how that experience helped me and helped me get through things, then I'll then I'll, I'll open that up as well. But you know, I I think that people just need to seek help and seek understanding. So, you know, I want to thank uh, Dr. Walter for having this platform, thank the executive producer, um, you know, um, um, and also um, Tanya and Sharnice for sharing their stories. Is, you know, it's is, is brave. It's, it's, it's something that you have to get to a certain point in your life to be able to even talk about these things. So I want to just thank everybody for their, for their stories. Thank you, Doc. Um, I just want to say thank you my both of y'all, you know, just my wife and, and, and helping me and letting me know that y'all were definitely on the side and just open up and I could press you definitely, definitely. I appreciate everything and um, I feel good about sharing. I feel good. Amen. Like, I feel like I've lost weight and um, my mind and I can breathe. I feel free. And this is not that thing uh, me and Tony laughed about. This is not made up, you know. I, I didn't. I, this not made up. I took all the makeup and all the mask off. I am really free. Wow. You know, I didn't have to take a hundred pictures to get that fake smile together. This one is automatic. And guess what? And the thing about it, ain't nothing really going right in my life. You know what I'm saying? But. <laughs> It's still things that's bad that was always bad that I would go get depressed and go to the deep end. That part has not changed. Those same situations I was going through are still there this time. They still there. But I know how to deal with them. I go to God. Then I move. So nothing like I didn't hit lottery or anything like that. I still got to you know, go where I need to go and do what I need to do. So nothing fantastic as people always say, well, maybe something good. No, I'm still broke. That's nothing, no income change, nothing. But my faith is I can think and I can breathe and I want to thank y'all for being there for me through my growth. Praise you know, God. I really appreciate it. That's I really appreciate it. So I just Thank you, uh, Mr. Kevin, the producer man and pastor. I thank y'all for praying for me. I believe those prayers. And once again, listeners, it's not your fault. It's not your fault. Wow. Tanya? I just want to say thank you to everyone that's listening. And I want to say thank you to... The three of y'all, like I said from the beginning, I appreciate the support. I appreciate the um, honesty. Tonight, um, we found out a lot of good and um, very important things about, you know, all three of us, all four of us, that maybe people didn't know. So this this will help a lot of people, like you said, tonight. And I want people to, to pray and uh, keep the faith and um, support, you know, a lot of things that's going on throughout the city because, if we all come together, things will get better for all of us. Wow. We're going to close out with a word of prayer. Thank you so much to Tanya and Fred and Sharnice and to the GMAT1 uh, family. Thank you for tuning in on tonight for another episode of Suffering in Silence, extended version uh, on tonight. We're going to close out with a word of prayer and then cl- turn it back over to our executive producer, Kevin Strider, holding it down inside town, Windy City. The winner is on the way, Doc. Bundle up because it's coming. Father, we thank you tonight for life, health, and strength. We give you glory for this time of sharing. Thank you for Tanya. Thank you for Fred. Thank you for Sharnice. We give you glory for what we have said and heard and 
felt on tonight. We pray, oh God, that somebody on the other side of the uh, broadcasting network have been blessed by this conversation, that they don't have to suffer in silence. We decree liberty, life, love, uh, and legacy in the life of the hero. We decree and declare that if they're in the kingdom, that no weapon formed against them shall prosper. We decree and declare that if they're in the kingdom, that they are the head and not the tail. They are above and not beneath. We thank you, God, that we are the lender and not the borrower, that you have given us the garment of praise for the spirit of depression. So, Father, we thank you, God. We give you glory. We give you honor. We give you praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Again, thank you so much for tuning in tonight. This is your host, Dr. Larry Walter, our Suffering Insider, coming to you live from the broadcasting booth. See you next week. Same time, same place. Peace. Thank you.